Okay, at this time, um, it gives me um, great pleasure to introduce uh, Maria Genoviak, who um, I've had the pleasure of um, hearing a number of times. Maria is the Deputy Director of the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science, um, which is led by the U.S. Forest Service. Her primary project is to coordinate the climate change resp response framework activities in New England and northern New York. Um, Maria has more than 10 years of experience in helping natural resource professionals understand and adapt to climate change, with particular emphasis on the northern forest ecosystems, which we're at. Maria was recognized with the Climate Adaptation Leadership Award for Natural Resources in 2018, and she's gonna discuss what's at risk, implications of climate change in our region's forests. Maria. I'm really happy to be here. Good morning, everyone. Um, I, uh, as um, Peter mentioned, I work for a group called the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science. We're a partnership that involves a lot of organizations. I myself work for the Forest Service, um, but I'm really happy to be here um, because the University of Vermont is one of our, our charter partners as well, um, and it's just really great to see how much interest there is in this really important topic. What I have been tasked with doing is talking a bit about the impacts of these uh, changes in climate that we're seeing, what they mean for forest ecosystems. Um, but I have a really short amount of time, so it'll be a, a summary that just skims along the, the surface. I will be pulling from the vulnerability assessment that uh, Jennifer so kindly plugged for us. But what I want to say on this slide is not to talk about our assessment, um, the one that I worked on, but it's to point out that for those of you who are in the rest of New York who've been feeling left out, um, we now have an assessment um, for the Mid-Atlantic region as well that has all of the same information. And so definitely go um, check that out. That one also came out about um, late last month. And so we, we now have coverage of the entire eastern U.S., which is really fantastic. And so what I wanted to do is talk about what are the climate change effects on forests and can't get into the details. And so what I thought is I would focus on three key ideas that you would be able to maybe remember to be able to talk to when you're talking to colleagues, when you're talking to clients, or when you're talking to people over the holiday season about what the takeaways are when we think about how climate change affects our ecosystems. And so I'll think about this in terms of shifting seasons, shifting species, and shifting stressors. And when I think about any climate change impact that affects ecosystems, they tend to fall into, they really do fall into one or more of these categories. And so to start with is to talk about shifting seasons, and that's perfect thinking about these changes that we're seeing in climate, how our weather is becoming altered over time. And when I talk to natural resource professionals, anyone who spends a tremendous amount of time outdoors um, in this region, as I'm sure all of you do, is everybody has stories to tell about how ecosystems are and how the climate is changing. Um, everyone has a story. And so some of these are good. When we think about northern forests, we don't have a very long growing season. I'm a gardener. I'm really you know, optimistic about longer growing seasons. And that definitely contributes to a lot of benefits in terms of forest productivity. But there's a lot of bad that's coming along with it. And unfortunately, we're seeing some of these effects already. And I think some of the places I hear about it most are for um, the foresters and loggers that I work with in terms of the challenges of um, being able to do their work, particularly during a warmer and more variable winter season. It's very disruptive to the types of activities that um, need to occur. But we also see it in terms of other changes in the shifting seasons, like um, recent reports that have come out talking about how the winter ski industry is under greater threat um, in the region, and how forest um, soil below ground processes are becoming altered by a lack of snow and changing winter conditions. And so as we go into the winter season, knowing that this is maybe one of the first signals, it's really important to think about um, how all these other ecosystem processes might be changing. And then there's just the ugly, which in this case is extreme events. And this region has been experiencing increases in extreme precipitation and other storms more than other parts of the country. And so you've really seen the um, a, uh, impact of some of these events, which are disruptive, they're very costly um, on ecosystems and on the 
um, environmental benefits, as well as the services and work that all of you do. <clears throat> when we think about shifting species, a lot of times, you know, I'll be talking about tree species, but we'll have other speakers who talk about wildlife and um, aquatic uh, wildlife as well, because they're affected. And so when we think about trees, we really do have, in this area covered by the FEMC, a lot of northern forests. We have trees that are adapted to cold climate, um, cold climate conditions. They have adaptations that are suited, whether it's white bark on, you know, on white birch uh, to reflect sunlight and to keep it from freezing, or the shape and some of the traits of red spruce that help it tolerate you know, cold winter temperatures. And as we think about climate, these trees that are adapted to uh, these current conditions are going to be under greater stress. There's the potential that other tree species could expand and have increased habitat, but there's a lot of questions about where that might happen and at what pace and how exactly those species might be able to move into new ecosystems and what that means. In the vulnerability assessment, we use three different climate models to project the outcome of different species um, in the future under, under climate change, under a variety of um, scenarios. And this is really broad trends. I do have handouts with me and there are details in the reports for individual eco-regions and um, places. But, you know, the big trend is that when we look at the species that are at greatest risk, it's those ones that we associate with the spruce fir ecosystems and the uh, aspen birch in terms of, again, those northern systems being at greatest risk. Um, there's a lot of species that we're not sure, and here it says mixed model results. And the reason is, is because those are, you know, very common species that go across the landscape. They occupy a range of um, conditions. They're very widely distributed. So there's a lot of places where they might do better or worse. But typically what happens is that for those species, um, when we think about things like sugar maple and white pine, those are expected to have greater stress and have um, reduced habitat in the future under greater scenarios of warming. And so the more the climate becomes altered, the more those species become at risk. And again, there are species that could potentially do better in the future, um, but you know, that's a depends on a lot of places on where you are in the landscape, and if you're very far north, you might not have these species, and so there's questions about how they might actually um, get to be where you live. And then shifting stressors, and this is the one where it's the big question. It's really hard to know exactly what will happen, and I am definitely not giving this one enough attention in terms of my talk, but the Department of Defense called climate change a threat multiplier when it comes to homeland security, and this goes back many years. But I think about climate change and the effects of disturbance on forests, and really that's where the threat multiplier effect comes in, because we have all of these different um, stressors, whether it's chronic stress associated with past land use or past management or past stressors. We have disturbances from extreme events. Um, insect pests, forest diseases, invasive species, which all seem to be um, enhanced in a lot of situations. And of course, the interactions among these are a huge, um, make a huge difference. And this is, I think, where a lot of the uncertainty arises when we talk to people, is how do we manage for this increased stress and these interacting um, stressors. And so when we think about the effects on forest ecosystems, it's really important, and I think one of the things I enjoy most about working with folks is thinking about how the ecosystem is going to change in a particular place. The science information is becoming more robust. We have more information all the time. We have overwhelming amounts of information. Um, and it's all really great, and a lot of times it's, it's pointing in the same direction, which is also reassuring. But the thing is, is that we know that climate change impacts are going to vary in space and time based on the ground conditions and the management that happens. And so we know that, um, you know, those of you who work in these ecosystems know them very well, and we need to be thinking about how general climate change impacts are going to play out in a particular place. And it's the local conditions in terms of the past and current management, that land history, um, the site suitability, our site conditions, and the management that are all going to interact with climate change to determine what happens in a particular place. And so when we think about that, we can think about how do we respond to climate change? Um, what are our options? And it's been really reassuring that we have seen a lot more interest in 
adaptation and how do we help systems adapt to changing conditions among uh, those working in forest ecosystems. I know that many of you have um, expressed interest in this for many years, and so it's really great to be able to um, see that and talk about that, and it's really evolved um, over the last five or so years I've been working in this region. Um, but it brings up interesting questions about what do we do. And one of the frameworks that we use is thinking about this spectrum of adaptation options because it's about those choices and how do you decide what interventions, what actions make sense in a particular place given your goals for those particular lands. And so we're increasingly seeing people have to choose between different actions, different options going forward. So when do you choose to resist climate change, to try to reduce the impact of those stressors, you know, maybe invest more heavily into protecting ecosystems against change, and um, particularly in defending these high value systems? Um, when do you choose to bolster the resilience of an ecosystem um, some people call this kind of the healthcare, the healthcare approach in terms of, you know, building the overall immunity of the system so that way whatever those stressors are, whatever those threats are, the system is better able to uh, cope with them and to bounce back from any perturbations that occur. But then also when are ecosystems challenged so much or fundamentally altered that we really need to think about how do we transition them to new conditions um, that might be better matched to future conditions. Um, so these are sort of the, the questions that people face and I get to work with uh, many of you and natural resource professionals from across the region to develop projects where we go through and think about climate change and um, take, um, try and match the actions to what matters in a particular place. And so we have tons of stories, even more than are on here, and I um, would love to talk about every single one of them because they're really great, and the people who are working on these have been really thoughtful in thinking about how their management um, can help adapt a system to change. Um, but I'll just cover some really brief highlights from some preliminary data when we looked across some of these regions. So what we have done is we looked at just generally of the different adaptation projects that we have going, how are those actions distributed across these kind of broad categories of resistance, resilience, and transition, roughly divided for northern New England and southern. And this is preliminary data. We need to, to go back now that we have a lot more projects and see. Um, but we see a couple trends. One I'll point out is that you know, the, the middle bar, the, the yellow one, is resilience. And so in northern New England, southern New England, um, we really see across the entire region that we work and across the country that you know, there is this big emphasis on increasing the resilience of ecosystems. And it's, it's also a bit of a, a buzzword too. Um, but it makes sense because a lot of times what people are thinking about is how do you increase the diversity of forest ecosystems so you have more options in the future? Or how do you promote, um, um, or how do you just reduce, again, stressors to boost the immunity, boost the ability of systems to cope with change? And so resilience feels really comfortable because it aligns really well with a lot of the management we've been thinking about for the last you know, several decades in terms of building ecosystem health, working with natural forest um, disturbance dynamics, thinking about ecosystem processes. And it's a really good home base, I think, for a lot of actions. Um, but we're also seeing, especially in southern New England, an increasing interest in these transition strategies of when do you acknowledge that systems are um, altered or that they are going to become altered and think about moving them um, towards another condition. And this is where it gets very uncomfortable because we're fundamentally doing something that we haven't done before. And I will just, I don't have an answer, sorry. Um, but the, we'll tell you that, you know, that's a lot of the conversation that I'm hearing is when do we make those calls and how do we decide when to do that and how do we do it in a way that is um, going to um, give us the best chance of success. And so again, I, do, I don't have the answers, but you know, in just thinking about the purpose of this conference, the theme on monitoring, it's absolutely critical that this community starts to think about and have these conversations because um, adaptation is, is adaptive. Um, in the idea of having non-stationarity of our climate in a world that's changing and you can't assume that's what's happened in the past will work in the future, every management intervention, every practice becomes a bit of an experiment. 
And this underscores the importance to be um, observant, to pay attention, and to be aware so that way we can evaluate whether or not these um, actions and these things that we're trying out work and we can be part of a community that communicates to each other what we're trying and what's working and what's not. So thank you. I think what we're going to do now is um, if anyone has questions um, to come up to the front um, and um, ask those questions. Anyone questions? All right. Well, maybe you can catch Maria throughout the day. Yeah, the, the question was how um, to, to increase people's ability to um, accept that climate change is happening yeah. and, and motivate the will to act. And that one is, yeah, that's, I mean, that's the question I think we all struggle with. And we've been doing some listening sessions and we'll be having one here today to get a, a better understanding of where people are on the issue. And this is one that keeps being raised. I think your question is exactly one that we're, we're hearing a lot. Um, I, I will say that I think that the um, acceptance of climate change is growing. Um, I will say, because I've been working in this for 10 years and we're able to say a lot of things and have people accept a lot more than in the past. Um, and so I do see reassurance in that and that I think the conversation is growing. One of the side effects of the fact that these extreme events keep happening is that people are, I think, increasingly starting to see this happen. But that's not everyone. I think what I would focus on is that as we're looking at this adaptation work is that so much of it is complementary to past management. You know, it's not, we're not saying do throw out the last 150 years of management or sustainability. Um, and so what I would say is just really focus on core benef um, co-benefits and values. And so a lot of the conversation when people are um, not necessarily getting it is because we end up talking about how much climate change is happening or is it happening. But if you can focus on the benefits that the forests are providing, you know, whether that's habitat or you know, economics for rural communities or um, any you know, water quality, whatever it is that that particular um, group is going to be interested in is really to start there. And we do see a lot of commonalities in terms of the adaptation actions um, from that. So. Great, thank you. <laughs>